morning with Pastor Shannon Jamal Hollimans. We are excited to be with you this morning. I have some announcements to share. The first will be on Sunday, February 11, we will be taking an offering for the Church Diaconal Fund. This is a fund set aside for assisting those experiencing hardships, and it is administered by the pastor and the moderator. Please give generously so that we might help with those needs as they arise. I want to draw your attention to these little cards in the pews. If you have any new information or you want to join a mailing list or you haven't been getting the email or something, you can go ahead and fill this out and put that in the offering plate and we will get your information updated. We have put together a pastor support team for Pastor Shannon. Our pastor support team will function by meeting quarterly with Pastor Shannon to offer the pastor feedback care and assure the lines of communication with the congregation is open. The members of the team are Lori Ingram, Andy Shire, and Jackie Towsley. All of you are encouraged to reach out to one of those people with any concerns you would like to see their team address. Next Sunday, Pastor Shannon will be exchanging pulpits with Pastor Ricardo Tavares from In Vivo Church in Grand Rapids. That means that while Pastor Shannon will be preaching at In Vivo, we will be blessed to worship with Pastor Ricardo here. Please join us in offering Pastor Ricardo a warm Lowell welcome next Sunday. Has he been here before? Not to preach. Not to preach. So you may have met him at some events when we've done um, sharing time with In Vivo, and I have met him, and he's wonderful. So hope to see you next week. Pastor Shannon is leading the book discussion for the book Jesus and John Wayne. This starts Thursday, February 1st, so this week. Um, if you need more information, you can see her. It's an excellent book. I've read it. Go ahead and um, check it out from the library, get it from the bookstore, whatever works for you. I listened to it on audio. It was fantastic. We still have those games available if you're interested in purchasing those. And I think, are there birthdays this week? We've talked about birthdays. Kim Lum's birthday's this week. Happy birthday. When is Nancy's? Yeah. The ninth, okay. All right. Uh, and Jana Lee, when is yours? The fourth. All right. Happy January birthdays. My mother's birthday Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. All right, that is what I have for announcements this morning, unless I've missed anything. Thank you. I invite you to rise now in body, Lord, and spirit to receive God's greetings for This morning. Grace to you, mercy, and peace from God our Creator, from God our Savior and from God the Holy Spirit who empowers and equips us in every good thing we do, including rooting for the lions tonight. Amen. <laughs> Please pass the peace of Christ to one another this morning. I invite you to join me now in the call to worship printed in our bulletins. Hallelujah, give thanks to God with all your hearts. Great are God's works, works to be pondered by all who love our Lord. Majestic and glorious are God's work. God's justice is faithful. We remember your wonders, God, for you are compassion and love. Those who look to you, your mercy is gracious. The works of your hands are justice and truth. Your words are power. You have sent out your people with praise. 
Hear us now, O oh God. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 547 in your hymnals to sing together Amazing Grace. You may be seated. It's now time for us to share together our prayer requests and our praises, the ways that God is working in our lives so that we can be praying for one another, not just today, but throughout our weeks. Uh, one prayer request we have this morning is for um, Ernie's friend, Sharon, um, who has been entered into hospice care. Um, pray for Sharon, pray for her husband um, as they walk through this valley together. Lord, in your healing mercy. Are there any other prayer requests people would like to share this morning? A joy and a concern. My great niece this morning delivered a nine pound, nine ounce baby girl. So we're very joyful for that. And um, locally here, um, my friend Sue Beery, who many of you know, uh, the Beery family, her brothers Chris and Joel. Um, my friend Sue is in the hospital in Grand Rapids. She's been in and out all week. Um, the kidney that she received years ago has failed and she's back on dialysis and many concerns for her. Thank you. Healing God for Sue, hear our prayers, and with the gift of life anew. Thank you, Lord. I'll just catch people up. I'm starting my treatments again on Tuesday, so exciting news, I guess, for that. Healing God to uh, eradicate Chester, is that what we're calling this one? 
to eradicate Chester, hear our prayer. Shannon, I'll just piggyback on that. My sister was diagnosed with cancer and um, how many, 20 years, 10 years ago. Yeah, there we go. And she's had various kinds of treatment. So I am thankful and hopeful that your treatment and my sister's continues to do its thing. And aren't we great or glad that we can live in this modern world with great medicine? God, for the power of medical technology, we give you thanks. A um, number of years ago, uh, while well, we lived up here in, in Michigan, my wife is from Central America, Lisette, and she often said, as March rolled around, she said, if we're going to get divorced, it's now. Uh, because she grew up in total sunshine, and uh, she suffers quite seriously from SADS, I think it's called. Well, so I give thanks for Florida, because once we retired, uh, she said, I am not doing this anymore. And I, uh, so there's been a number of things that we have done. And uh, I dropped her off in Florida a couple weeks ago. And it's just fascinating to see how she just, just really brightens up. And uh, she goes to a UCC there and loves it um, and goes to Bible studies. And these are things that she never had done before. And uh, so, but she's there, she's very happy. I'm glad she's there. I'm gonna go spend the month of March with her. And I just like it better here, so I'm just crazy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> God, for the gift of sunshine, we give you praise. Healing God for a diagnosis, hear our prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. I invite you to look at the um, congregational prayer that is printed in your bulletins in the handout. I will read the words uh, that are not in bold, and I ask you to read along together the words that are in bold. Let us pray. Oh God, distant yet near. We gather as witnesses to your promise that if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Be among us this day. Hear the confessions of our mouths and the yearning of our hearts. Help us change the narrowness of our vision and the pettiness of our behavior. Forgive us for all the ways we fall short of your call on our lives. Make us new again with your holy grace. Grant us the maturity to accept your many gifts in humility and use them with faithfulness. Fill us with your spirit that we may serve you with integrity and energy, ever witnessing to your holy presence in our lives. Equip us in the abundance of your mercy to share that mercy with those most vulnerable to the weapons of neglect and hate. Jesus. Shape our service that we might reflect your power and your love in all our ways. We praise and give thanks to you, eternal presence. Through Jesus Christ, we pray the words that he taught us. Our God who is in heaven, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Save us from the time of trial. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Out of the abundance of gifts that God has given us, we are called to give just a small portion back to God. So if you have an offering, I would invite you to um, put in the plates as our offering collectors come by and pass them this morning. And as they do so, uh, I invite you to listen to the song that is played and to meditate on what the mercy and love of God looks like in your life right now. Let us pray. We worship with our whole hearts and give with our whole hearts, remembering your covenant with us, O God. As we share these gifts, may they be for the work of faithful justice and gracious mercy through your church and in your world. Amen. You may be seated.
At this time, we'll have the young people come forward. I have some magic tricks today, so I need somebody to hold this. Amazing magic tricks. I've amazed some people already this morning with my amazing magic tricks. Theo, you want to help me? Come on over here. What card do you have? A nine. Okay, hold that. And which one is this? A six. All right. Regular deck of cards here. Go ahead and stick the nine and the six into the deck of cards. There's one. There's two. All right. Say, amazing. Okay, ready? Ready? Whoops. Threw those everywhere. Are these your cards? Deidre doesn't believe me. They're right here, Deidre. Do you want to hold them? Okay. I'm going to show you another amazing magic trick. See, during COVID, bored. So I spent a lot of time with this rubber band friend, and I trained him to do tricks. He doesn't bark. He does jump, though. Okay? He's a jumper. See him? See where he is? Ready? See him? Did you see him jump? Yes? Amazing, right? Do we need to do that again, right? Okay, all right. See him? He's going to jump. Ready? Did you see it? <laughs> One more time. One more time. Okay, ready? He jumped. Amazing. You're properly amazed, yes? Yes. All right. In the Bible story today, they're going to talk about amazing things that, pe that Jesus did. People were amazed when they came around him. Amazement is that sense of wonder and shock and joy that you get when something happens that maybe you haven't been able to explain before. Okay? And that's a really cool and awesome feeling to have amazement as you felt this morning, right? Properly amazed. And so that's something that we can get to with our relationship with God and with Jesus is that amazement, wonderful feeling. Okay? So I'd like you to join me in prayer. Dear God, thank you for all the amazing ways that you come into our lives. Thank you for the amazing ways that you teach us to go out and be your people. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise now in body or in spirit to sing number 52 in your hymnals. There is a voice I love to hear.
You may be seated. It says in your bulletins that uh, Andy Shire will be sharing a testimony today, but Andy was sick this week, so he will not be sharing this morning. His testimony is being moved to next Sunday. So we will go ahead with our scripture reading this morning, which comes from the book of Mark, the first chapter. I will start reading at verse 21 and read through 28. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in, a, in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? a new teaching and with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him at once jesus fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of galilee here ends the lesson may god transform understanding into action friends we are slowly making our way through the book of mark if we imagine that we are Mark's first readers, the audience of this book in Rome, we're still getting to know Jesus. Now, first impressions then, as today, were important. And in Mark's story, the story of Jesus, Mark begins by introducing his readers to Jesus as a teacher, and a teacher who had authority. The impression that Mark is trying to make on his readers was of Jesus as a teacher with power. We meet Jesus here teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. I've actually been to this synagogue. The ruins are still there today. The faithful gathered in synagogues on Saturdays and took turns reading from the scriptures and expounding on them. Mark tells us here that Jesus was the one who stepped up to do the reading that day. And when he did so, something was different. When Jesus spoke, he did so as someone with the power to actually do something about what he was saying. This was different than the teachers who usually stepped up to the podium. The teachers of the law, the scribes, spoke in theories and ideas, concepts. So the way that Jesus spoke, as someone with the power to actually do something about what he was saying, completely amazed them. And beyond them, as we see in this morning's story, Jesus showed them he was more than just talk. We don't know what an unclean spirit was, what possessed this man. In that culture at that time, saying that someone had an unclean spirit was usually a way of saying that they were possessed by a demon. And demons were often used to describe someone with a mental illness but it also could have been someone with a visible manifestation of any kind of physical illness or even an addiction. We don't know precisely what's going on with this man, but we do know that this was the person in the room struggling and in the most pain. I don't know about what stands out to you in this morning's story, but what stands out to me is that while the people in the synagogue that day were amazed by Jesus, the one person who was able to identify Jesus for who he was, the Holy One of God, was the man with the unclean spirit. The person visibly in profound pain in that moment. He's the one who saw Jesus for who he was. He identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God because he knew the Holy One of God was a threat to his pain. He saw him, he really saw him and what he came to do. And he recognized that the goodness and the righteousness of God is completely incompatible with pain and suffering. 
Mark tells us that Jesus rebuked this spirit. Shut up and get out, it's literally what he said. And it left to the utter amazement of all the people in the room. But Mark points out here that the people present were not just amazed by what just happened, they were also amazed by the teaching that Jesus had just said paired with what happened here. We don't even read what Jesus says here. We just know that what Jesus says comes with power. And his power, identified by the person in the room with the most pain, is used to end that pain. You know, I grew up in a small, white Christian community, a community that held really tightly to the Bible's teachings, tightly to a fault, I would say. I was taught that the Bible was quite clear, that truth was black and white. Right and wrong were obvious, because while they couldn't articulate it this way, the people that taught me the Bible believed that the Bible was meant to be read literally with a Western lens informed by theology written by Northern European men 400 years ago. Now in the UCC, we like to say that God is still speaking, but the church of my youth informed me that God spoke once, it was good, we've got it, let's just try and control it and manage it. It's a narrow understanding of God's word, and frankly, it's not really good news, not for most of us. My experience of the gospel growing up varied from what I actually was taught because I experienced the gospel quite differently. I learned about faith from my father, who's a Muslim, someone who showed me the importance of living what one says. And by his living, he demonstrated for me the life-giving power of seeking justice and loving mercy because that is what God does for us every day. And my dad knew that, and my dad has lived that. Unlike the teachers in my Christian schools and the pastors in my church, I saw and experienced my dad living out generous mercy and grace because he knew that mercy and grace in his life. People recognize when people are all talk and no action. I recognized it as a kid. I know you did too. People can say God is love, but when they use those same mouths to condemn people, people created in the very image of God, to hell, something's not lining up. What sets Jesus apart from the other teachers was his power to do what he said. My dad frequently speaks in Motown song lyrics, particularly from the 1960s when he worked in a record store in Liberia and would get all the Motown records to sell. And one of my dad's favorite uh, people to quote is the iconic James Brown. And there's this James Brown song that kept coming in my head this week as I was reading this text. The song is called Talking Loud and Saying Nothing. As a follow-up to this sermon, I encourage you to go on Spotify and listen to the great James Brown sing that song. Because in it, he says the lyrics, like a dull knife, you just ain't cutting. You're talking loud and saying nothing. It's an indictment on hypocrisy. As people trying to follow the way of Jesus, we need to be mindful about what we say and what we do because the last thing we want to be found doing is talking loud and saying nothing. Because our actions speak more loudly than our words do often, what we do and what we don't do. Our daily activities, what keeps us busy, does that show the power and the love of God to the people around us? Can the people in our lives see the teachings and actions of Jesus and be amazed by it. Guess what's not good news? Telling people that they need to believe in the name of Jesus and they will be saved, that's it. Friends, faith is not a formula. It's not about believing the right thing or even doing the right thing all the time. Faith is trusting God to save us every day, not just when we die. 
And if we live like that, people will see who Jesus is. We have to demonstrate it. Otherwise, we are just talking loud and saying nothing. I don't know how many of you know what Emily and Jay Elms do for a living, but they are people who I see living and demonstrating the gospel with their lives. Emily met Jay when they were both serving as medics in the U.S. Army. In 2018, when the use of marijuana was legalized for medical purposes and adult recreational use in this state, they were among some of the first people to get a license to produce. I often hear people complain about the ways that the community here is saturated with dispensaries, the ways people are abusing marijuana. But the legalization of the use of cannabis or marijuana in this state has actually led to life for many, many people. CBD, a substance found in the cannabis plant, has been found to reduce seizures in children with epilepsy. And many forms of treatment are, they are resistant to, but cannabis is something that's been helping them and helping them without long-term side effects. CBD is also helping aging adults dealing with chronic pain, pain that has often been dismissed as untreatable, can now be treated. The legalization of marijuana in our state has been translating into racial justice for black and brown lives that have been disproportionately penalized in our state for possession. The legalization of marijuana has generated thousands of dollars in tax money for the city of Lowell. I think we have a new boat and a new police car to show for it. Now, I don't use marijuana, so there's a lot that I don't understand about it. But there's one story that has stuck with me a story about the way that marijuana use has cultivated life for someone. A year ago, I had a conversation with a recovered drug addict, and he shared with me his struggle to rebuild his life after serving time in prison, how hard it was to find a job, how hard it was to keep a job, to reconnect with community, to build a new life where he could make healthy choices. And one of the biggest challenges to him doing so was his addiction to cocaine. And it was the use of marijuana that finally ended cocaine's power over him. He got on the right path, the path to healing, the path to recovery, where he could experience the love of God because of his marijuana use. I think our human tendency is to write things off, to write people off as good or bad, as right or wrong. But what Jesus showed us again and again is that anything has the power to control our lives. Even the law of God can be misused and abused and turned into an idol, something that's used to harm people instead of offer life. That is what the teachers of the law were doing in Jesus' day. The law of God was being stripped of its power because the teachers were turning it into mere words words for controlling people, words for condemning people, but words that lack the power to transform people's lives. Emily and Jay have made it their mission to use the gifts that God has given them to serve people by creating a quality product that has the power to give life. Talking to Emily, you hear that. God is calling them to this work. They're not in it for the profit. This is their ministry. And Jesus is calling all of us to be about the work of creating and serving others that testifies to the power and the love of God, to the good news that we have in Jesus Christ, which isn't something that's just preached on Sunday mornings. The good news is meant to be lived. The teachers of the law in Jesus' day were talking loud and saying nothing. And friends, there's no greater disservice to the good news of the gospel than that, than to say that Jesus saves and then fail to demonstrate it. Now, I'm not saying I'm great at this, because honestly, I think what Jay and Emily do is probably showing people the good news about Jesus better than I do preaching here on Sunday mornings, because they're offering healing. Our words have to match our actions. 
what we say and what we do. So I can preach at you Sunday morning and say, yep, this is what you ought to do. But if I'm going out there and cursing you and treating you like crap, why would you listen? The love and the power of the gospel, the power to heal people, the power to save people, not just when we die, but right now, that is the message that we've been given. What a weight, but what a privilege that is. God is still doing amazing things. The Detroit Lions are playing in the playoffs today, guys. <laughs> what greater testimony is there than that? I see it all the time, though, in this community. I shared about Jay and Emily, but I have seen so many of you living in ways that demonstrate the gospel so that people know it's not just words. The gospel is real, and it's amazing. I invite you now to stand as we say together the affirmation of our mission statement. It's printed in your bulletins, but it's also on the wall here. Responding to the living God with a progressive voice and working hands, we are called to feed Christ's community mind, body, and spirit. I invite you to turn to song number 403 in your hymnals, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Before we should go, I should mention I did have Emily's permission to share about her in the sermon. Just so you don't all like sit here terrified that next week you're going to be called out. I did ask permission, so don't worry. Let us go with these words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious toward you. May the Lord's face turn toward you again and again in this week and give you peace, both now and forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.
Thank you so much for 